Sometimes we live life in the middle of a storm, left out in the open, exposed to the elements. No matter where we look, protection seems miles away. Shelter feels out of reach. Lately, these storms have grown stronger, more intense, more difficult to bear. Where do we look when we can't see the way forward? How do we find a safe harbor? In the midst of the ebb and flow, God promises to be our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. In our most desperate moments, we can rest safely behind the rock of our salvation. Protected by the shadow of his wing, Yes, life has its troubles, but our God is a mighty fortress, our stronghold, our refuge. Well, we had some storms this week, didn't we? Oh, my goodness. Uh, we actually had a little bit of flooding in here as a result of that strong one um, early in the week, but um, certainly want to be praying for those in the Caribbean uh, islands, those that are in Texas uh, tomorrow. They're supposed to be hit uh, Category 1 uh, coming up out of the Gulf, so let's be in prayer for all those folks uh, that God's will will be done. want to make an announcement first time uh, today uh, that we're going to be having our 31st um, annual um, anniversary picnic on September the 15th. Um, this is uh, 31 years of being uh, a church, and 3 p.m. in the afternoon at Bruce and Pat Kozak's home in Galena, Maryland. Obviously, we'll get you there. Uh, we'll give you directions, but just want to tell you way ahead of time, so you put it on the calendar. On Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, we'll hang out together for a few hours and just celebrate the good things that God has done in our church and in our own lives. Let's please take our Bibles now and turn together um, to the book of Judges. You don't hear that every day. You don't hear that every Sunday. Well, these days you do, but after the next few weeks you won't. Uh, but Judges chapter 4, and we're going to begin in verse 14 and read till the end of the chapter and then the beginning of chapter 5. So Judges chapter 4 and verse 14, the Bible says, Then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him, and the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted, nice word, old English word, just got off that horse and his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Herosheth, Hagoim, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. However, Sisera had fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. And there was peace. There was an accord that had been reached between this clan and uh, Jabin, the king of Hazor. And uh, he was the, also the king of Canaan. Um, and the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, and do not fear. And when he had turned aside with her into the tent, she covered him with a blanket. And then he said to her, Please, it's kind of comical. It really is. I mean, this is the, the, the guy the entire nation feared more than anybody else. And he runs into this lady's uh, place, which that was against all customs to have a man just come into a married woman's house. But she was like compelling him, come on in, you know, we, we have peace together. And, and so he just, he, he just made a quick snap decision. He was running for his life anyway. So he gave it a chance and he fell down on the floor. She put a big blanket over him. And I just imagine him laying kind of on his side and the blanket just showing the form of his face and body as he laid there. And the Bible says, please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a jug of milk. She didn't give him water. She gave him milk. I don't know if she just thought that would make him go to sleep. You know, our kids, when we give them milk, you know, it's like, get to sleep, go to bed. 
Stop. You've been going a thousand miles an hour. So milk, she gave him milk, gave him a drink and covered him. And he said to her, like he's still a control freak, right? He's, he's like, he has no leverage at all in this situation. And he's, he says to her, stand at the door at the tent. And if any man comes in and inquires of you and says, is there a man here? You shall say, no. <laughs> she said, okay. Covers him up. Then J.L., Heber's wife, immediately went and took a tent peg. And I don't want you to think of a little peg. I'm th- you know, I mean, spike. It was big old metal spike. And she took that tent peg, and she took a hammer in her other hand and went very softly to him, could see the outline of where the blanket was covering his head, and she drove the peg into his temple. You see my finger? Right here, right next to your eye, right here. She, she, he was laying on his side. I don't know how you lay when you sleep, but he apparently laid on his side. And he was just like that. And they just went right, and she just put it directly right through his temple. What a lovely Bible story. Amen? Put it right through his temple. And it went down into the ground. And he was fast asleep. I guess he was. This is a biblical sleep, like he's never getting up. And he was weary, so he died. And then as Barak pursued Sisera, J.L., he didn't know this had happened, And Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man whom you seek. And when he went into her tent, there lay Sisera dead with the peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, in the presence of the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, the king of Canaan. Quick side note, we already made a connection that Jabin was like Satan. He was a type of Satan. Uh, He also was a king of kings, king over kings. And so uh, this is just a little exciting, you know, biblical uh, narrative at the end there to remind us that we're, as believers, uh, we're up against a strong enemy, but we have a stronger person on our side, and that is the Holy Spirit, that is God Almighty, and we're going to keep pursuing, and we're going to keep fighting, and we're going to keep fighting, and we're going to win, amen, and he will be destroyed and put out of business, and thank God uh, that that is really the subtext here. Now we get to chapter 5, which is called, this very famous chapter called the Song of Deborah. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, when leaders lead in Israel, When the people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, and that is um, Mount Sinai is another name for it, Deuteronomy 33.2. For those of you who want to do a deeper study of that, there are different names for Mount Sinai, and Seir is one of them. And it says, when you march from the field of Edom, The earth trembled, and the heavens poured. The clouds also poured water. Verse 5, the mountains gushed before the Lord. And here it is, this Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. Today's message is part two, the unsung hero number three, Barak, the heroic worker and his queen bee, that is Deborah. And I'm entitling this part two up for today is the day of your deliverance. Father, we need deliverance. We need salvation, Lord. We need continued salvation. Not just a point in time where we now are in the kingdom of light, but Lord, a continued deliverance from evil and sin that comes against our souls, our very minds, our hearts, our bodies, everything. I pray, God, that you'll help us to be reminded that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, and help us to stay with it. Even when the times get hard, when it gets difficult, help us to stay with it because you've assured us the victory is ours in Jesus. And we thank you for what you're going to do. Help us, like Deborah, to be people who sing praises to you because of the great things that you have done in our lives. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. It always is a blessing. It really is. 
you know, it's just uh, you're on my heart, you're on, in my prayers. I know I'm in your, my wife and I are in your prayers. 100% know that to be a fact. And we're so grateful to get together uh, in person. Those who could not be with us that are watching online, um, we're very grateful for them as well, for each one of you who are doing that right now. And uh, we just invite any of you, if you are on vacation or if you just get sick and you just can't be here, make sure you stay faithful uh, to tuning in uh, and watching on www.harvesthouse.church. You can do it 24-7 in the archive section, uh, 365, anytime you want, and uh, hear the word of the Lord. And, and I know that you do that, and that's a blessing to me. In a recent magazine article, it was written that Americans are living in a post-heroic age. And that got my attention. Uh, since we're talking about heroes, biblical heroes, especially the unsung heroes, right? But this article makes the point that as young people today and young um, adults are much less likely than their parents to have heroes, and those who actually admit to having heroes say that those heroes are either dead or historic figures, or both, I suppose, um, but they are not so many... Uh, people who are willing to even admit it these days. I have a, a, a phone uh, library. How many of you have books on your, app, like an app that says books and you download books? Anybody? I hope I'm not the only one, but I've got like a, I've got like a library there. I, I've got, you know, lots and lots of real books and have for many years, but I find it so much better and easier and convenient uh, to look on that, you know, that phone and, and to read that way and or on a device of some kind. And, um, there's one that I have that is over a thousand pages. Of course, on a phone, it's easier to get to a thousand than in a real book, you know. But it's over a thousand pages long, and it is written by William Bennett, a former U.S. educational secretary. And the name of the book, you probably have read it and probably have it, many of you. It's called The Book of Virtues. And Mr. Bennett recently made this following uh, statement and comment on this trend and on this topic of heroes. He says, quote, it is particularly important for young people to have heroes. He said, this is a way to teach them by moral example so that we can point to someone as an ideal, end quote. And, and I think that's true. Um, unfortunately, in today's world, in our social media-driven society where you just can't really do anything without it being plastered all over the place, um, we have found that there's exposés almost every single day. You find somebody who you at some point in your life looked up to as sort of a heroic person in your mind as much as you can say that about anybody, and, and yet and they just kind of fall apart in your mind because uh, of, a, of something that you discover. And um, so this need for heroes, and if it is a need, which I believe it is, uh, is at a crisis proportion. I've always believed, and I have had great teachers who have taught me, make your Bible heroes your, your heroes. In other words, get into the Word of God. And, of course, your, your number one hero should be Jesus Christ, right? Because he'll never disappoint you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never fail you. Uh, the more you get to know him, the more you're going to love him. And uh, he'll never let you down. So that's just a given. But uh, there are many other people in the Bible, even with their flaws. When I say heroes, I'm not talking about perfect people because, you know, we're, none of us are perfect, right? So, uh, but we can still be heroic in the faith. And uh, those stories are preserved in God's Word. And so there is a need. And it's one more reason why this series, I believe, is so timely and important. Of whom the world was not worthy over time with faiths unsung heroes. And I think the timeliness of this is something that we can all agree on. The original launching point of this series was Hebrews 11.32. And I want us to look at this verse once again. It says, what more shall I say? For the time would fail me. So you like ran out of time. Or the Holy Spirit doesn't allow the writer of Hebrews to actually develop the, the stories behind these next people. So we have taken up on that and said we're just going to go into overtime. If he ran out of time, then the stories are in the Bible. So let's go back, go into overtime, and see what God has to say. But for the time would fail me to tell of these people, Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, 
also, which is the dividing point for us, because we're not going to go into David. We know much about David, and we will eventually be talking about Samuel as we get into later summer series. So we're just drilling down on these folks here. And so far, we've done Gideon and Jephthah, and now we're on Barak, and then we'll end in Samson. Uh, Samson's going to be an amazing uh, story and also lessons filled with blessings for us. But what we want to know is that Barak is the one who is mentioned here. And the person that is not mentioned here is very, very important. And this is one of the reasons why God wants us to go back and see the story, because there, he couldn't really get into the detail of the fact that there was a woman behind this man that made him the, the man of God that he actually turned out to be. Her name is Deborah. And her name literally means bee. I call her the queen bee behind this heroic worker. Now, we're kind of thinking of a bee colony and the queen bee. And I had mentioned this last week. I wanted to kind of encourage you to go and maybe do a little study. Uh, queen, queens are amazing. Uh, really, if you do just spend a half hour, you'll be scratching your head in amazement at what they do and how important bees are in general in pollinization for us to be able to exist on this planet. So the queen of them, pretty important, right? And so we've got a queen bee, uh, the, the queen bee of the worker, and she has workers and she has drones. So we're just calling him a worker because he did do great faith works. And I called Deborah his queen bee simply as a play on words. Me, her name in the Hebrew literally does mean bee. And given the critical importance that a queen bee has within the bee colony, and surely that parallel is there with Deborah because she has a critical role to play not only in Israel's life, but as it turns out, in the life of Barak in particular. And with this in mind, I want us to take time to drill down into what God has to say, what he's preserved in his word about this amazing, great woman of God named Deborah. Deborah's resume is pretty impressive. I want you to go back now to Judges chapter 4, and I want you to look at verse 4 because this is where the Bible begins to develop the character. You know, you're writing a story, you have character development, and you see Deborah. It says this, now Deborah. A prophetess, number one, the wife of Labadoth, number two, was judging Israel, number three. So there are three things that we see on her resume immediately. Number one, she was a prophetess, a female prophet. Um, she was connected to the Holy Spirit. Like what, when she had something to say, uh, the Bible says that a true prophet of God, when he said something, it came to pass. We have a lot of so-called prophets on the social media these days, especially. I mean, it was unreal during the pandemic because we were all stuck in our homes and we were watching a lot more TV and a lot more uh, social media than we probably ever had in our life and probably ever will again. And there were a lot of people that were taking advantage of that and there were prophets rising up all over the place, uh, self-proclaimed prophets. And as you look at their track record, you realize, wow, about 95% of the things they said didn't come true. Well, that's all you need because the Bible says one thing. If there's a prophet that tells you one thing, he says, I'm a prophet of God. Or she says, I'm a prophet of God. And what they says does not come true, then you can just say, thank you very much for that. You are disqualified. Uh, biblically speaking, they were 100% accurate because they heard directly from the Lord, right? So that's an important thing to know. And it was good that she had information to pass on uh, to um, Barak. And, and so that's exactly what she did. So she was a prophetess. She was a wife. This is interesting to me because she was married to a guy. I've never heard of a Lapidoth, have you? Uh, I don't know what his shortened version was. Lappy? I, I, who knows? L dilapidated? Is that what you said? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, but this is interesting. So Labadoth, Labadoth means lamp and enlightened one. Now, if you were paying attention to me last week, and I know you were, you hang on every word that I say. There is no doubt that you heard what I said. When we were talking about Jabin, I told you last week, Jabin, the king of Canaan, who is a type of Satan, I said his name actually means enlightened one. You remember that? Because uh, Satan comes as a angel of Light, enlightenment. Now you've got the husband of the prophetess 
his name means enlightened as well. Huh. So you've got Satan who comes and pictures himself as a angel of light, enlightenment, and you've got the world system out there that's trying to tell you they've got the way, we've got the insight, we've got the enlightenment. But then there's another light, praise God. There's another enlightenment that she was married to. Are you following me? So she had this deep relationship with a greater light, a greater enlightenment, and it it helped guide her way. She wasn't uh, drawn away by the light of Jabin. She had not only the Holy Spirit, but she had a husband whose name actually meant enlightenment. I hope you caught what I just said because that's what we, that's really us. We have a relationship. We are married to Jesus according to the Bible. We are the bride. He is the bridegroom. We're married to Jesus spiritually speaking, and he is the light of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. That is the Word of God, but He's the Word of God incarnate. So I'm just saying, what a beautiful picture that is. And this is her life. And then we see that she's a judge. So also she was a woman who truly lived up to her name. Like a queen bee, she proved to be prolific and dedicated and industrious, not to mention full of the Spirit of God. She was able to hear the voice of God, and she offered up her considerable leadership skills as a very valuable asset to the kingdom of God and to the kingdom of Israel as they were trying to, you know, represent the Lord in this world. Deborah Deborah actually stands as the earliest example of a female head of government in world history. That's important to know. I think it's kind of cool that the Bible is able to tell us about the first of a lot of things, and she was the first female head of government. Sadly for Israel, what that actually means is that there was a great spiritual dearth or lacking within the men of Israel since evidently there were very few men that were willing or able to step up to leadership or to be a judge of the people to judge, and, and judge according to the law of God. Judge according to the truth of what God wanted and what he needed done. These people came to her looking for judgment, looking for insight and wisdom. Now, even Barak Barak himself, when he finally was summoned by Deborah, as he comes to her presence in the uh, verse 5, it says she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah, Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Then she sent and called for Barak. So from her governmental seat, she calls for Barak after she receives the word from the Lord to do so. And when he comes up to her, he gives a very weak response to what she prophesies over his life. Judges chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And it's kind of strange that he would say that. Now, the story unfolds, and it becomes obvious that Barak actually did have the giftings to lead, that Barak actually did have the capabilities to not only lead, but to lead with excellence and to do great things for God. So it wasn't like he didn't have the ability. So we have to kind of come to a conclusion that he had lost his ability to hear the word of the Lord or to hear the voice of God. And there are some of you in this room today, without any doubt, that there was a time when you really were close to the voice of God, that you, were, that you could hear his voice, that through his word, that you know, the spirit of God would lead you and you were able to discern the will of God in your life. But for some reason, you've allowed the world and uh, the cares of this world to come in between you uh, and the Lord, crowd him out, and you feel there's a, a distance, there's, a, there's something between you and the Savior, and maybe you don't really know that to be a fact, but you don't seem to have the connection you used to. That's kind of what Barak was. He, he didn't know what God wanted him to do, and so he wasn't going to try to figure it out on his own. But Deborah came to him and spoke... I would put it this way. She called him out, right? I mean, this wasn't like a private, hey, you know, go tell Barak to come to me. I mean, it was an announcement, and everybody knew he was coming, right? So he call, she called him out. You know how we say, well, you called me out, or I'm going to call you out, that kind of thing. That was the same idea. But also, she called 
out of him. There's two different things. She called him out, and, you know, so we can call people out. We, we, can, we can dress them down. You know, we can tell them what for, give them the what for. What, you know how we say, we just tell them the way it is, right? But then there should be, as a spiritual person, you should be able to then call out of that person greatness, spiritual greatness. And, that, and that's not always easy, and it's not always the case. We're easy. We're good at the front end. We're not so good on the back end. We're good at calling people out. But we're not so good at calling out the greatness in them. And we need to do both. That's what Deborah's example is to us. And thank God she was able to do that. And she should be um, honored uh, for what she did. Now, it may have been out of a profound respect for her that Barak responded the way that he did. Uh, we don't really know his motive. But this is what he said. And again, I read it earlier. Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, regardless of what his motive was, this is the net effect of it. Barak's response provided a very unique opportunity for Deborah to exhibit the depth of her prophetic giftings and insight. Because it is often assumed that when she responded and said that, I am going to go with you. But the victory that God's going to give us, will, you will not get the glory for that, but that glory will go to a woman. It is assumed that she was talking about herself because what other woman could she be talking about? She's the most famous, the most powerful woman, right? So that was kind of an easy one. It's like a softball prophetic moment, right? But actually it wasn't because she wasn't talking about herself. She was talking about another woman, another situation that only God could possibly know. And this is where it really gets interesting because we're not talking about, hey, you know, kind of discerning tea leaves by guessing what things are going on. No, the Lord speaks. And afterwards, because it was only afterwards in chapter 5 when De Deborah and Barak are going back after the victory and they're singing the song of Deborah, that even they had the truth dawn on them. It is true in our lives. We'll go through things. We'll see God work, but we don't really understand all of it until later. And as we're worshiping the Lord, the Lord gives us clarity. And I mean, in our own worship time, could be in church, but all of a sudden there's this moment of clarity. Oh, that's why that happened. Oh, you know, and you, have you ever had that? I mean, that's an amazing experience where just all these pieces just all of a sudden come together and you say, oh, I get it. I get it. Lord, you're, how did you know that, God? You know, how did you know to do that? How did you move all those pieces so that we would end up in that situation? I remember um, personally, personal note, uh, when we started feeling, I mean, probably five years before we actually ended up selling the Liberty property, that whole um, property that we had there in Bear, the Lord began to lay that in my, and it was the weird, it took a long time for me to, I mean, you just don't wake up one day when you have a dream and all that we did to, to make that happen um, through the Lord. Of course, he did it all, but I'm just making the point that there was a lot of time and prayers and everything invested. You don't just wake up one day and do what we did. It took probably five years when I, um, I brought it up to my leadership team for the first time. And, um, you know, it, and it went over like a lead balloon, as it should have, because it wasn't the right time. But it was just a thought the Lord had given me. So he had begun to, you know, break up the fallow ground, to begin to think outside the box, so that when the time came, and in my own life, so I can relate to Deborah in a moment of urgency saying, now is the time. Up, get up. This is the day in which the Lord will deliver you. And she, again, they did not know all the details. They didn't know how it was going to happen. And she didn't even know exactly how it was going to happen. She was just speaking the word of the Lord. And so there have been so many times, church, where as we have shared the story of this property and how we got here and I have said that people will say to me, so when did you when did you purchase this? I said, 2018. They said, do you realize? I mean, this I've had this happen dozens and dozens of times. We're just people who know the market, know this area. I mean, if you if you know this area at all, you know how crazy it's gotten since 2018, right? So they said, You realize how fortunate you are? And I'm like, we're not fortunate. Like it it, it was it was God. I mean, it was sitting here for eight years. 
It was here on the market for eight years before we came into the picture. And the Lord had it preserved. I have no question in my mind. Uh, if we would have dragged our feet and not done it when God told us to do it, we'd have missed the window of opportunity, and we would not be here today because we couldn't have afforded it. Three years later, this, this property skyrocketed. So I, I'm just giving you a personal example how when the Holy Spirit, get, and it's time, and he says, up, oh, do it now, you don't have time to say, can you just please go into a little bit more detail? I just, you know, because you can do that if you want, but it is possible that you're going to miss a window of opportunity. You've got to be sure it's the voice of God. But when the Lord says, get up, you get up. When he says, go, you go. And you don't look back and you press forward until he gets the glory, right? And I can see so many things that happen that there is no possible way that uh, we could have done it. Uh, we couldn't orchestrate it, but God did it. And, and so I know you could share stories like that. I wanted to share something the Lord reminded me this week, how that acting in a moment of, of urgency when everybody else could not see why, like couldn't understand why, the timing, uh, how it actually played out to God's glory, that he put us where we needed to be in this place that is exploding. We've got hundreds and hundreds of new homes right across the street from us. We're in the middle of a sea of humanity right here. And God had preserved this in his counsel. He didn't tell me all that. I didn't even know this place existed. My wife and I had never seen it. Um, and none of our leadership team had ever seen it when we made the decision to do what we did. It was only after we took that step that then the Lord began to show us what he wanted us to do. And he'll do the same thing in your life as well. And we can give him the glory and go back and say, that's all God. And, that is, and, that, and you can't say anything but that. So she wasn't talking about herself. Deborah was actually talking about another woman by the name of J.L. And J.L., J-A-E-L, we've already read her story uh, as I did my opening. J.L. would be the person, the woman, who was given the honor of single-handedly taking out Israel's most oppressive enemy by the name of Sisera. And um, it was through a series of events that it was impossible for Deborah to have known outside of the brilliance of the Holy Spirit's insight. And I have to go back and just reiterate this because we do the, the prayer, the blessing at the end of the service every single week. And uh, I have a, I've done a very, very deep study of that prayer. It has become, it literally affects just about everything I do. And, and so there, when you talk about the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face, and then the word shine is so critical to me because I often, almost every day, remind myself that as he's shining his face, the word in the Hebrew is or, O-R. And it's, if you think of O-R, it is part of two very important words in the working of God. Number one, door. So D-O-O-R, door. So when he shines his face on you, he's giving you an open door. He's saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. O-R also is the part of a word order. O-R-D-E-R. -E what does the Bible say for a man and woman of God every single day? That the steps of a good man and a good woman, because it's just man is the titular head of humanity. It's just the steps of a man are, say it with me, ordered by the Lord. So when does that take place? When does the Lord order? Does he send you mail? No. When does he do it? In your prayer time. He does it when you're worshiping him, when you're still and letting him be God in your life. He will or when you come to that point when you're in relationship with him and he, he shines his face upon you, he's not just, you know, oh, the warmth of God's face. No. He's doing something supernatural. He's He's giving you an open door. And by the way, every single day, you need orders from headquarters, right? You need a door. You need to know what door. I mean, Solomon needed it. He says, I don't even know how to come in and out of a door. Well, who are we? Solomon was the wisest man who's ever walked on planet Earth. And every day, he had to go to God and say, I don't even know how to go in and out of a door. Please help me. Well, God says, or. I shine. I'm going to shine away, and I'm going to open a door for you today, and I'm going to tell you in your spirit, this is the way. Walk ye in it, and I'm going to order your steps. Praise God. Listen, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise right now. Please do that. Come on.
Thank you, God. Thank you, because I, don't, I can't do that. You can't do that. We need his help so desperately. And so we see this beautifully coming out. JL was there, was God's woman at the right time to take out an enemy who, I mean, this has been going on for a very long time, 20 years or more, where they had been, you know, oppressed by the king of Canaan and by this man named um, Sisera, who was the head of his army. So by the time we get to Judges chapter 4 and verse 7, we find out some critical information in Deborah's prophetic word that she gave to Barak. So notice Judges chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, and against you, so this is God's word to Deborah, who Deborah now is telling Barak what God had to say. And she says, and against you, God says, I will deploy Sisera. So Sisera thinks he's doing it on his own. At the very least, he thinks he's getting orders from Jabin. But God says, I'm going to deploy you. That's important, right? So all of our enemies out there that think that they're plotting against us, all right, and, and, and spiritually speaking, the enemy trying to plot against us, just know one thing. Nothing's going to happen outside of the God's power. And his, uh, his will. I mean, he's, he's going to allow even wickedness and even wrath will bring glory to him, but it's got to pass through his hands. It's got to pass through his fingers. So when something terrible happens in your life, at least stop and say, God, this has already passed through your hands. I know this did not just surprise you. It shocked the living daylights out of me. But I know you know the end from the beginning, and I am going to trust you. And so that's, what, that's what's happening here. So it says, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishan, and I will deliver him into your hand. Now, this is God's battle plan. It certainly wasn't Deborah's. I mean, she didn't come up with that. She came up with that from God's word. And Barak didn't come up with it. He just heard it and had to make a decision to obey, and he did. He acted on the word of the Lord. So here we note that there is a battle plan revealed, and now the federation of nations headed by Jabin and the king of Canaan, the king of kings, right, is now uh, uh, being putting forward their man. His name is Sisera, and he is a man of great pride. And this is where I want to stop for a few minutes and talk about how God wins the battles in our own lives against the enemies, because the enemies against us are walking in their, uh, their godlessness. They're walking in their pride. I think about our world and our nation, and I, even this week I was overwhelmed with the godless mentality of this world. And, and there is a particular um, party, a political party in our country that has actually cut God out of their platform. I heard it with my own ears. It's been years, but I mean, absolutely. Cut him out. Cut him out. Right? And yet the president of the United States, who's the head of that particular party, had the nerve to say that he would drop out only if God Almighty would come down and speak it to him. He said it three different times this week to George Stephanopoulos. And I want to tell you something. God is coming down. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's coming down. And, uh, and so uh, if, you really, if you believe in him now, like you would actually do it if he came down, let's just believe in him in every moment of every day. Amen? I mean, because he is real and he is coming down. But he can come against our pride. Our pride is the thing that will take us down. The Bible says that pride goes before what? Destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. So this is found in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, and we see pride everywhere in the life of Sisera. Number one, I note the pride of position. In verse 7, it says uh, Sisera was the commander of Jabin's army, and he wore that. You know how some people, when they get authority, man, they just abuse it. I, you know, I am the boss, you know, and they're just, you know, instead of earning the, the, the respect and earning uh, all of those things, I mean, they just take that position and beat you over the head with it. And if you've been a person who's 
who's been under such a person in any kind of corporate situation, you know how horrible that is. If you are a person in business right now and you have authority, be like Jesus. Don't be that guy. Don't be that guy. You don't have to abuse your authority. Your authority has been given to you by God. And humbly expel it, use it for him, his glory, and give him the glory, and, and, and walk in humility. That's not what Jabin did in a pride of his position. The second thing I see is the pride of his possession. At least four times, the Bible says that he had 900 chariots of iron. And the reason is, is because they, this was the sales pitch that they used to try to intimidate Israel. I mean, they, you know, this is the guy who has 900 chariots of iron. You got no shot. You know, it's just that intimidation get into your mind. We've got 900 chariots of iron. So it became a source of pride, possession. I've got this. You don't have that. You don't have a chance against me. Thirdly, the pride of influence. It says, and the multitude. You notice at the end there, it says, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude. This is verse 7. Well, guess who has a greater multitude than Sisera? God. Our God is Jehovah Sabaoth. Do you know what that means? The Lord of hosts. The Lord of angel armies. You talk about a multitude. Our God has a multitude. And if you were humble, you would humble yourself under the mighty hand of Jehovah Sabaoth and not be looking at your multitude as if it's something. Always put it in the context of the greater multitude that our God has. Do you understand what I'm saying? He was a man full of pride. And as a result of that, uh, seven verses later, Deborah announces that there is a charge that in this day, on this moment, we're to get up, for today is the day. So in verse 14, we opened up with this. Then Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord has delivered. And he, she goes on to define to, to what, what was delivered. But the point is, spiritually, this is the day I'm going to work to bring about your deliverance. So Barak went down, and I want you to read exactly what happens as this verse unfolds. This is the day the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? That's a good question. It's a rhetorical question. It's a Hebraic a rhetorical question. It's, it, it already is self-evident what the answer is, right? And it's a question that we could all ask ourselves. Like, hasn't the Lord already won the victory? Like, what are you doing? Why aren't you standing up and working for God? What, he, he has to do more? Hasn't the Lord already won the victory? You see what I'm saying? That's what she was doing. She was challenging him with something that could not be refuted. So the Bible says, so Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And notice this. I love it because under my Bible, I, I underlined, so Barak went down, and then I underlined, and the Lord routed because that's what I want to see. So Barak went down, but the Lord routed. You see, we cooperate. We do the will of God. He tells us what to do. We do it, and as we're going, because the Bible actually says as he was going, the Lord routed. So he, it wasn't like he did it, and then God said, okay, you can go. No, he says, I'm doing it before you. I'm going before you. I'm preparing the way before you in the presence of your enemies. And so that's what he did. Notice that the Lord routed. The Lord did the routing, and he routed Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. Barak, right? It's not with him. He was doing it before him. And Sisera alighted, so he saw he, he was done. He alighted, or he got, gets off of his chariot, and he begins to run away on foot. Now, I want you to think about the move Sisera makes here because it's completely illogical. When you consider that he had an iron chariot that would have been much faster, much safer had he just kept going, like just take it and just ride off into the sunset. But instead, he gets off of it and he runs away. That doesn't make any sense. It's illogical until you add God's unrefrained logic into the equation. Because, see, God's ways 
are not our ways. And our ways are not His ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are not His thoughts, saith the Lord, Isaiah chapter 55. And so, though chapter 4 deliberately avoids giving to us more details regarding exactly how God pulled this victory off, by the time we get to chapter 5, and this is what I was alluding to earlier, the chapter containing one of Scripture's most famous songs called the Song of Deborah, but it actually is the Song of Deborah and Barak, but it's the Song of Deborah. It's only during that song that it all starts coming together, even for Deborah and Barak. They didn't really see how it was working until after the victory was won, and then they start singing praises to God. It was like the disciples. Like, do you remember in the, in the New Testament after Jesus arose from the dead, and there's times where the Bible's talking about they were talking, and they were like, oh, yeah, he said, oh, that's right. He, you know what I mean? It's like it dawned on them. Oh, that's right. He was supposed to rise from the dead after three days. He said that about a million times. But, oh, you know what I mean? It, it was like he told them. And they couldn't, they didn't hear it until after the victory. And they were like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense now. <laughs> you know? And we're like that as well. There's things that are like right in front of our face, very obvious what God's doing. And by the way, other people can see it, but we just can't see it. And then later, it becomes very obvious. So what we now discover in Judges chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, is what Paul Harvey would call the rest of the story. I love that. I love the rest of the story. I miss that so much. Judges chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, when leaders lead, praise God, when leaders lead, what are leaders supposed to do? Lead. And when they do their job and they lead through the Spirit and when the people willingly offer themselves Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, now watch, the earth trembled. The heavens poured. We didn't, that's new information. We didn't hear that, nothing like that in chapter 4. All of a sudden, in the song of Deborah, they start recounting. Oh, wait a minute. This is how God did it. The clouds also poured water. The mountains. Okay, so you've got the weather involved in the fight. And now they give praise to God, who is the God of the mountains. And he gets the mountains involved. And Mount Sinai had been holding. I don't know if you've ever seen. I just saw it the other day. There was a, a clip on social media about the tsunami in Japan, and there was just these people walking along the side of this riverbank. And, and it was just like five minutes of like what it was and how quickly things changed. The tsunami, how it changed, just completely wiped everything out, right? And so that's what I'm saying is that, well, those people were walking along that, and they didn't know. I'm like, get away. I mean, don't you know there's a tsunami coming? No. So they got wiped out. And so our God, who is not bound by time, right, we know, he knows the end from the beginning. So he's telling Deborah, there's, he doesn't say the details. He doesn't go into details. He says, just do it and do it quickly. I need you to do it and tell Barak to do it now. But why God? See, this is the question that wasn't asked. Because God wasn't going to tell him why. He just said, do it. And that is, that's, that's preaching right there. Because if you'll just take that to heart, a lot of things are going to go well for you because you don't have to have all the answers. What you have to have is the peace of God that passes all human understanding. I had a huge decision recently that I had to deal with. One of my brothers in this room shared it with him. And he said, how can I pray for you, Pastor? And I said, I need God's peace. And the way the Lord did it was he didn't give me, like he gave me such lack of peace on the initial decision I made that when the right decision was made, I knew the peace of God. Like in other words, the peace was really all I actually did need. I didn't know how it was going to play out, but I did know one thing, that I needed his peace more than anything else. And that is what I'm trying to say to you. 
is that there is this peace of God that passes all human understanding. We need that more than anything in this world. And they don't know what's going to happen, but it happened God's way, and the water came down. Now, I want you to think of something. There's another story in the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea? Well, they went over the other side, and, the, and there were a bunch of chariots. Ah, oh, sounds familiar. A bunch of chariots coming from the enemy. At probably 900. I mean, who knows? Probably exact number. <laughs> who knows how much it was? But Pharaoh sent an army to go get the Israelites. And they went right into the middle of the Red Sea, and then God caused the water to come over them and wipe them out. So when the water started pouring in, their chariots got stuck in the mud. And this is where I'm, I'm actually getting to is that the reason Sisera had to get off of his chariot is because his chariot was stuck in the water that was coming down from the clouds and coming down off the mountains. He couldn't. All those things that were on his liability or on his asset side of the ledger suddenly became his liability. And this is how God works because in our case, a lot of times we have things in our liability side and we don't understand why. God says, I can change that in a moment, trust me, and they can be flipped to be your asset. God can flip it. And that's what he did here. The things that were the assets of Jabin and Sisera as they came against to wipe off Israel from the map. That's what they wanted to do. God changed it in a moment. And here's what I want to remind you, because this has not changed, is that Deborah's God and Barak's God, who is our God, is ultimately also the commander-in-chief of the armies of heaven and earth, Jehovah Sabaoth, and he happens to be the chief meteorologist of the universe as well. In other words, he's the supreme weatherman, and God knows what he's doing. So Deborah, all she had to do was hear God, and, and God said, now tell Barak this. I'm not giving you any more details. And she told Barak, and now Barak had to believe God through the prophetess, and all of those things came to bear, and they ended up going to a place called the River Kishon, which at this time was a dry bed. In other words, there was no water there whatsoever. And now you're starting to see. God said, I know what's, com what's coming. I know what's coming. And I need to position you in the most unlikely place. I'm telling you to go to the river Kishon where there is no water at all. It was completely dry. It was a riverbed with no water. So now they're all in the river Kishon, right where God wants them to be. And the enemy has all of their chariots right there. And God releases the water. <sighs> And the battle was over before it started because everything they were relying on. I mean, suddenly when you've got water everywhere and you've got all this heavy armor on and you've got this iron chariot, you're dead in the water, literally. And God knew it. And it was not because of their ingenuity. How smart are you, Deborah? You are such an amazing guy, Barak. No, we just heard God's voice and did it. And he got the victory. And he's going to get the glory. The word Kishan, I want you to write this down literally means hard, difficult, and laborious. I love this. I love unlocking the truth that's one tier below the storyline because this right here reminds me that when we come to that hard pathway in our life, when we come to the difficult, the really difficult times of our life, it's just laborious, right? That God reminds us of our path forward being simply this, to cast all of your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. And to remind yourself of Jeremiah 32, 27, which I want you to write down and memorize this week, stat. Can I just use the word a memorization stat, right? You got to do it now. Do it, you know, this week, tonight. Write it down somewhere. Put it on a card and just look at it every day throughout this week. Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh, is there anything too hard for me? I put this on my Facebook this week because God just really blew me away with it. It's just a reminder. Nothing's too hard for me. And I want you to put that in your soul. 
But the exact reason that God chose that place, the River Kishon, was because of something that was about to happen that only God could have possibly known about. Namely, the River Kishon was about to experience a sudden and phenomenal amount of water from not only the massive storm of biblical proportions, but also from the pent-up rains and swelling water reserves from the upper regions of Mount Sinai. And it was all going to happen. It was a natural phenomenon. It was God didn't make that happen. It was going to happen. And God worked within the confines of nature and said there's going to be this phenomenal moment when all this is going to happen. And I, I'm going to take care of some business during this. When, when tragedy takes place, God knows when to act in our lives. I remember when um, some crises have happened in our, in our country. And I'm trying to remember, Rahm Emanuel, do you remember, does anybody, Rahm Emanuel was working with Bill Clinton. And uh, he made a statement, he says, never miss a, the opportunity in a crisis. I, that's a paraphrase. But the point is, is political smartness says, when there's a crisis, take advantage of it. And that was not a positive thing. He was just like behind closed doors saying, there's really bad things going on. We can get a lot of things done. We can get our agenda. Like, we can push through some things. Like, let's take advantage of this crisis, right? But I would like to paraphrase from God's perspective, when the crises come, when all of these converging things are happening, God uses it for his glory and his advantage. So let's look at it that way. Because that's the way he works. And so there was an immediate saturation, the dry riverbed, reminiscent of that Egyptian army that I talked about earlier. And these chariots began to sink in the suddenly muddy and miry messiness of that now filling up rapidly riverbed called Kishan. The members of the army were stuck. The battle against God's people was turned devastating things happened. The rain suddenly came, and Sisera saw it. I mean, he was at least smart enough to realize he was done. He got off. He left his guys behind and ran as far as he could and ran right into the arms of a woman, J.L., who he trusted. Again, he's a political guy. He knew they had a, an agreement, probably had met her um, at the agreement table because they had worked a political affiliation. So he was like, oh, at least there's somebody I know. And she's like, she played up on it. The Holy Spirit had already told her what was going on. And so she was like, come on in, come on in. You're, you'll be safe here. And so he lays down, and she puts a blanket on him, and he goes, he goes just tell him I'm not here. <laughs> it's hilarious. Tell him I'm not here. And by the way, I need some water. And she gives him milk and then kills him. His last meal, milk. I mean, it's amazing. When we obey the voice of God through his word and his mighty spirit, he does amazing things. God gave a prophetic insight to Deborah through a prophetic word based on the knowledge that up to that point only the Lord knew concerning a soon-to-be-released phenomenon from the weather. And it was the perfect opportunity, as I've mentioned, for God to do wonderful things. This explains the urgency of the word in verse 14, up with an exclamation point. You know I'm an exclamation point guy, right? There it is. Up, like she was so excited. Up, it's now, let's do it, let's act. Why are you so, like, hyper? Like, what, what's, so, what's the big deal? Because God said, now or never, you must move now. And when God talks like that, you better get up and going. And it was only when they did that that she spoke the word of truth. She spoke the faith before even a single evidence of the flooding of the rain was manifested. And the Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so I would like to close my message by simply taking that urgent command, which I have called this sermon up for today is the day of your deliverance. And turn it towards you and me. I've already done it to me. You say, Pastor, how does it feel to preach to people? Um, I preach it to me about six times before you ever hear it. I mean, and I mean, I preach it hard. And I have had to repent many a time at my own sermon. I mean, honestly, you, these, these things are important. And, and so we have, to, we have to act upon it. 
Today is the day of salvation. Today uh, is the accepted time. Today is no longer acceptable for us to just be sitting around idly. But Jesus is coming soon. I've been reminded, I watched a very pretty, it was a pretty long interview with, um, I, I, I think her name is Cynthia Clemenshire. I can't remember her last name, but the, the girl, the woman who's like 50, in her 50s now, that uh, the pastor in Texas, uh, Mr. Morris, had molested when she was 12 years old. That story has been all over, all over the world. I mean, this is like the top megachurch in the country. And he made a horrible mistake, he, and he did it for a long time. And he covered it, and, um, and it's just been a nightmare. And, you know, as she shared her story, it, it is a reminder that these are days where, you know, God's, he's in the, in the business of revealing. He's, he's revealing. And he says judgment begins at the house of God. And that's us. You know, we like to point our finger at the world, but we've got we to allow God to point that finger at us, and we have to be courageous in our faith. So I'm going to give you something. This is in your notes. I'm going to have it up here. Courageous faith overcomes societal disadvantages and debilitating fear. Many of us feel like we're at disadvantage as believers in our society but we can still have courageous faith and speak God's truth because he cannot fail. His word does not return void. And when you have a debilitating fear in your life, just know that God will strengthen you. So rise up. God will go before you. And I just want to end with this thought is that the Bible says that God routed the enemy before uh, before, um, Barak. So think about the word route. I'm going to play on it just a minute because God, another way of saying a route is like I'm taking this route, right? This is I'm taking this direction. So God will give you the route because he says, I, it, it, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your route, your path. So he'll give you the route, and as you follow the route, he will route so, and it's spelled a little different, I know. The route has an E, this one doesn't, but it still sounds, and it's pretty cool. Because you, it, if he'll give you the route, if you'll take it, then he'll route. He'll take care of you. And this is the truth. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his word today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word, Lord. And I'm asking your Holy Spirit to now take the conviction that you have absolutely brought to bear in our souls this morning and help us to interact with you right now. Whatever it is that you're telling us to do, help us to do it. Today is the day. We need to get up. We need to act on your truth and believe you. Stop asking for more directions. Stop asking you for more details because you're not going to give us any more details until we've actually acted on what you've already told us. So help us to act in full faith and confidence in your power and your ability. Father, I pray that you'll save someone today who does not know you as Savior. If that person is listening to me in this room, I pray that they will ask you to save them now. And what I mean by that is to invite the Holy Spirit. The gift of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit, the new birth experience where the Holy Spirit will come into your human spirit. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 15 and following talks about the new birth, the new creation of the Holy Spirit creating a new man, a new woman within us. That's the new birth. That's the most important thing that can ever happen to anybody in this world is the Spirit of God creating a new person, a new man within us called the new birth, being born again. And once that has taken place, God has a spiritual beachhead in your life. He has a place to work from. And God, you want to do great work in our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, and through our bodies, the members of our bodies, Lord, our hands, our feet, our eyes, 
our mouths, our ears, um, every being, every part of our being, God, you want to use and employ in the work of you. But, Lord, it starts inside. And so I ask you to do a work in my life and in all of our lives today. I'm just going to be quiet for a few minutes. I want you to just talk to God and make some decisions in your own heart. Pray to God. He's listening to you. He's listening. And just, uh, just talk to him right now. I'm praying for those of you who have certain burdens today that you really can't share. You don't feel at liberty to share, but, man, it's a heavy burden in your heart right now. And I just want to remind you, God knows, He hears, and He cares. He loves you more than any person ever really could. And I pray that we will just roll our burdens to God right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a wonderful day. You guys have been amazing. Uh, Brother John, would you come on up here and hang out with me for a minute? I know that um, this week I heard um, some God moments. I'm hoping that we'll have somebody next week. I told you that we're going to start sharing some God moments uh, at the end of the service, um, and we will do that. And some people have started sharing some with me. Um, as the Lord does a miracle in your life or something that you want to share with the body, let me know, and this will be your moment as well. Brother John, I love you. Let's go ahead, and let's all stand together. Would you do that? And let's put our hand out. We're going to go ahead and do the blessing. It's up here just in case you don't have it memorized. I would encourage you to actually pray this every single morning, every morning. And, uh, and even if you're by yourself, you know, putting your hand up. I, I often, uh, if somebody, you know, and I'm in a, a, a secret place, but a lot of times I'll even uh, pull over or something, and people will see, and I'll have my hands, both hands up, Okay both hands, but one hand is fine, even when you're by yourself. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord bless you guys, and hallelujah. Thank the Lord for his shalom. Amen.